Um, what I'm going to do now is talk to you a little bit about the desktop aspects. So let's go ahead and just spend, you know, 45 minutes or an hour on the desktop. All right. So Joe, I stole some of his time for no good reason. Yep. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and shut down my camera. And I also, now it is officially back. And you know what? Let's go uh, ahead and launch this. So at least we know that the third, the uh, the extra trackers tend to cause a problem. Um, so as you can see, uh, it is doing fine now. <laughs> All right. So next week I will be way more prepared for that. It was a little bit seat of the pants, which is uh, always not suggested. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll make sure we can talk you through the MR stuff and hopefully um, look into some fixes because currently Canova is in early access. It is in beta. Um, we want people to try it out, communicate with us about their experiences with it, and uh, you know help us make a great sculpting application. And I've done quite a bit of stuff on the desktop side of things. And so for a sculpt that was um, actually almost entirely desktop. I'm going to open this up. This is a rather large file. Um, it is a kind of a demon character. And this is just something where one weekend I'm like, you know what? I just want to sit down, watch a movie on my other screen and just sculpt something, you know, off the top of my head. And uh, I was kind of impressed at how far I could get, a, get along with it, how much detail I was capable of adding to it. And uh, it's something that, um, you know, I was pretty pleased with, especially for an early piece of software. Um, and especially areas that I end up having a lot of trouble with. Um, I mean, who doesn't have issues with hands, especially on a character sculpt? Uh, because the, it's, it's very hard to lay out the fingers and really organize that. And I really like doing sculpts that have a, a certain structure to them, but also a limpness to them. And so I wanted this character as I sculpted him to kind of be somewhat in the posture uh, it would be while it was actually standing, but also like it's kind of floating there, right? You know, because I feel like that's gonna lead to, um, in the end, once he, you know, this character is retopoed and things of that sort, um, something that is going to deform, in my opinion, much better uh, than something that is in an extremely static pose. Now, as you can see, it's performing quite well. Um, we actually made a lot of performance enhancements or improvements in the past two weeks. Um, we decreased the amount of memory that was used dramatically. I think it was almost like 50%. And then also um, the size of the actual files. We found a lot of extra data in the ADF, uh, um, uh, in the ADF field or you know, the AD field um, that we didn't need. And so we were able to eliminate that. And that's the kind of stuff that Villa is doing that is leading to really great advancements. Now, um, another thing that we improved is we increased the speed of... Uh, mirroring. And so this is one that we are constantly working on right now is trying to improve the speed and the performance of mirror. Um, you can see with this character, which has gone as far as it can uh, really um, while in Canova, because it's around 4 million polys for now. If I come over here to stats, um, you can see triangles, it's 4 million triangles um, at this point. And if I come over here to my view and we go ahead and take a look at all layers wireframe, <laughs> you take a look at that wireframe, it is dense. I mean, it is crazy, crazy dense, but it has local resolution in areas. So so if I were to sculpt this um, using multi-resolution technology, it would be much, much, much higher. Um, and so go ahead and turn all wireframes off. You also can turn wireframes on specifically for uh, an individual selected layer, um, as you can see here, or all layers simultaneously, which is great. All right, so if I come in here and say I wanted to start working on these abs a little bit, um, you notice that it is a little bit lumpy and that has as much to do with the approach that I'm using for sculpting in right now. And also uh, one of the things that we want to address um, in Canova is we are constantly working on the feel of the surface, how to produce cleaner, smoother forms. 
Um, and in this case, I, I wanted to treat this um, a lot like just a clay buildup process. You know, every time I work like this, I always think of August Rodin um, and his sculpts that are just bits and bits of clay layered up on top of each other because it's very much the same process. Now, if you want to have pressure sensitivity on, because I'm currently using a Wacom tablet, you can turn on pressure sensitivity for strength or radius. I typically don't turn on the radius um, uh, pressure sensitivity, but you can. And also we can go ahead and come down here and change the strength down to two or three because at this point I'm nuancing forms more than anything else. And right click and, uh, or uh, yeah, right click and drag is going to allow me to change the brush radius. And you see if I sculpt right on top of that right now, nothing really happens. I just get this blob and it doesn't blend in, does it? Now I'm not on the right layer and this is the thing that you have to really um, keep in mind. Now you can also switch between layers. Say I'm down here on a separate layer we can't even see. I just hover over my model in the viewport and hold down the middle mouse button and we should be able to click on that. There we go. And now it's switched on over to my primary layer. Now you want to make sure you have smooth blend on when you're really building up these forms or you're going to end up with more of a large blob shape, right? And so you can see that I can go ahead and sculpt on top of this. And this is something where we need to switch back and forth between the um, wireframe view and not pretty frequently uh, because I want you to understand what's going on when the brush changes size. Um, so if I come over here to my view and I turn my wireframe on just for the selected, you can see it lowered the resolution. Um, we also, by the way, in a recent build that we only have uh, internally right now, uh, we've changed the opacity of the wireframe so it's easier to see the wireframe but also see the model behind it. Um, and so you can see how it lowers that resolution. And if I go ahead and raise this even further, it even lowers that more and it does not like that very much when I do that on this very, very dense mesh for sure. Uh, but it's something you wanna keep in mind is that as you change the brush size, you are actually changing the amount of geometry that is being applied to the model itself. Um, and I am currently on a Titan X of the, of the uh, GTX 9 series. It's basically like the GTX 980 and it performs great. We did test out Canova on a 780 the other day, right Joe? And uh, it, the 980, big, 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 big difference. Um, and that was actually even on the desktop side as well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and discard that and we are going to start up a new session of uh, Canova. And does anybody have any suggestions on what we should start making today? Any thoughts? Yeah, I figured you would. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I'll talk through some of these things uh, while we're doing this right now. Um, so getting prepared, right? I'm going to get ready to sculpt right now. Well, we've got this sphere right here. It's about a 30 centimeter sphere. We actually increased the resolution or the size of that sphere um, in uh, about two updates ago because uh, we seemed like people wanted to have much, uh, a much larger sphere visible. Uh, now, if you come on over here to the Scene tab, you can turn on the Sculpting Bounds and you can see the boundary for the current ADF layer and because uh, this is the space you, you're able to sculpt in. Now, you can, of course, have multiple layers and have them overlaying each other, and that's the way that a lot of people have been kind of achieving more complex sculpts is moving these together. And if you, in the Layers palette, actually have them parented under each other, um, they will follow, um, one item will follow the motions of another item. Now you can also turn on the mirror plane, but you'd wanna have mirror on for that so you know really what plane you're, you're really working on. And uh, I'll turn that off just for now. And I'm gonna come over here to, uh, let's go ahead and I, I'll just erase this. And so I'll just go ahead and chop that out of place. There we go, and boom, it's gone, right? And you also are able to actually change the, you know, uh, the camera type to say, for instance, orthographic. And so in this way, you'll always be dealing with a flattened camera in space, um, which we know some users find useful. I personally almost always work with, uh, with perspective turned on. I like to have my depth. Now, as I stroke on top of, or in this space, we also have a work plane. And if you just stroke out in space anywhere, then, or, you know, inside this sculpting bounds, of course, that work plane is automatically going to activate itself. So you have something that you're able to actually stroke on top of. And that is, as you can see, it's already set. But if I go ahead and I come over here um, to uh, my actual 
view and uh, let's go ahead and excuse me one second uh, excuse me layers we can come on down here to the work plane and we can actually reorient this uh, to align work plane to camera and so now if I come back over here I'm able to actually stroke on top of that individual item which I think I am outside my sculpting bounds right now and I do not want that mirror plane on which I seem to have lost that for some reason all right there's something that we need to go ahead and uh, actually make changes to and so now we need to come on down here and reset that back to normal and if I come on over here to the scene itself and I also want to come over here to my camera and turn orthographic off. Now you can switch between your views just by hitting one, two, three, four, five, six, as you can see here. And if I come on over here to my layers, there you go. Now we can actually see that work playing in place now. And so there we go. And we can go ahead and keep on sculpting away on that. Uh, have there been any suggestions on something to sculpt? Why did somebody say a turtle? Because I was seriously thinking about that this morning. I was like, you know what? Maybe a turtle. Uh, a ninja turtle. All right. Yeah, let's do a ninja turtle. Or at least start on a ninja turtle. Um, you know what? Uh, let's do a hand. Um, I know that sounds a little weird. I know I asked what you wanted me to make. Um, but I'd like to almost do a full character over the span of a couple streams. Um, so that we can really show you what it's like to really work in it. Like at least, you know, at least spend a total of three hours doing a full character. Uh, but one thing that I've been kind of really interested in is how, or I've been kind of amazed by is how useful the volumetric sculpting is uh, for, uh, for, for like limb structures uh, like that and actually making a hand. I found it very easy, especially like a loose hand. And so let's go ahead and make kind of like a, uh, like a, I guess a, a three fingered hand. All right. And so let's go ahead and grab our layer tools sphere and we'll go ahead and I just usually get rid of this in VR. It's super, super easy because you're just erasing it in space. And uh, I want to make sure that my camera is not orthographic. It's perspective. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And so let's go ahead and come right on up here. And I'm going to kind of come at an angle. And this is going to be a rather large hand, all things considered. And we will go ahead and come on over here to align work plane to camera. And now as I begin to sculpt, it's having a little bit of trouble. It fell a little bit further back. So let me go ahead and reset that because we really only need a little bit of, uh, let's come to my, view, my layers, excuse me. We only need a little bit of clay to begin working with and come to the work plane and reset that and come back to my layer and see that. All right, cool. All right. So go ahead and just create that initial clay and it's way, way, way back in space. And that's because of the resets that I performed. All right. So as I keep on producing more and more clay, man, this is just not liking me today. We're just working in desktop. We'll just turn it into desktop mode. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. And right now my work plane is at the center. And so we'll go ahead and come on over here and just make a little bit of clay that's right there in the center. Now we aren't going to turn symmetry on in this case uh, because we are making an asymmetrical object. And so let's go ahead and make this as though it's going to be uh, a large-ish hand kind of at an angle as though there's a whole another body coming out behind it. And I want my pressure sensitivity on. I probably want my strength to be a little bit lower. Uh, one of the things that we want people to be able to do is you notice, by the way, um, I don't have smooth blend on uh, when I'm building up these forms. It's kind of useful just to go ahead 
and create the actual stroke forms themselves based on the physical size. If I hold down control, I can change that strength. Uh, we want to try and make, make it so that smooth is derived from the actual smooth brush as far as the strength you set there because right now it is being derived from the actual sphere brush, which is what I'm currently using. And so... Yeah. These are the talks we have, it seems like, every day, right, Ed? Yeah, exactly. And so now I'm going to turn that on, get that strength way, way, way lower, like five. And we'll go ahead and pull that on out. And it is a rather large brush. And I want that smoothing to be much stronger than it already is. And it is such a strange thing, just seeing the clay appear and disappear. And one of the things that, uh, you know, you need to remind yourself of if you are already familiar with multi-resolution sculpting is you are not deforming a surface. Uh, you are actually adding more surface or removing existing surface. And the actual, um, the volume that you're creating is constantly changing. So it does change your perception of how things work. Now, something else I like, I'm just gonna show you guys this even though you don't have access to it, but um, it's a custom shader that we were kind of playing around with and it's fake subsurface scattering, uh, which makes it a little bit more attractive, makes it uh, a little bit more comfortable to work with. But you can also see that as I change the brush size, the behavior of the mesh changes as well. And so we'll go ahead and turn this on around. Now, if you want uh, to actually see things from a different angle you can hold down control plus shift and right click and you can drag the mesh around and so that way you can view it the you know from different angles so say i want to move the bottom and at any point in time you can come over here to layers and uh, make sure your active layer is selected and you can reset that and it will go back to its origin um, another thing we recently did and this is something i was super excited about showing you today um, was on the vr side of things you actually have underneath your uh, your layers in the VR um, uh, uh, menu, the option for scene or camera. And uh, you've used two button controls. You're able to scale your item up and down. Um, previously, you weren't able to reset the camera transform specifically. And uh, you actually, um, if you scaled it up, it, you couldn't get it back to its original scale. So we added the ability to um, reset your camera scale, allowing you to basically set your, your item scale back because it's obviously very useful to take a full character that is, you know, six or even eight feet tall and then make it, you know, a foot tall to work with for a little bit and bounce back and forth, but always getting stuff back to the point you want it to be at. All right. So if I come over here to my tools, my sphere brush, and we'll go ahead and pull that strength on down and we got that at three or four and I want to just start building out the initial knuckles and there we go there we go and uh, I'm gonna make it a left hand because I am left-handed and we'll go ahead and start pulling out this form over here any questions or comments popping up Ed sure you most certainly can uh, in fact, right here, uh, we have add uh, reference model and also add reference images. Um, add reference model currently only seems to work with one. That's one, we, one thing we want, we want to look at. Um, add reference images, I haven't run into a limit yet. Yep. And in VR, you can position that and scale that up wherever you want it to be, which is awesome. Okay, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> um, it's, it's something that, especially in the VR side of things, could be very useful. Desktop as well. Um, UI is early in its growth. Um, one of the things that we want to focus on most during these early stages is increasing quality, increasing performance, increasing uh, the positive perception of brush feel. Um, things of that sort. So, you know, I mean, anybody who already knows Moto's UI 
um, knows that we are a fan of those types of approaches, but that's probably not going to be in the short term, just to be very straightforward about that. But I'm a super big fan of Pi menus and more, more than just on the desktop side, I think it would be absolutely killer in VR. I mean, if you had almost gesture-based controls um, using the VR hardware. Wow, Ed, you just said that. <laughs> Have you really? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to be like, that'd be a great video statement. Yes, it definitely will be. Um, that is something that is high on our list of priorities for sure. And so now I want to go ahead and bring this on out a little bit and get this on up. So, go ahead and reduce that a little bit. Yeah, the move brush is definitely a big one that we want to spend a lot more time with. And i go ahead and yank this on over. Got lighting that I am comfortable with and start actually subtracting. And so, right now I'm actually pushing the mesh in, which may not be completely and totally obvious. Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, I find that early on I use the sphere brush quite a bit. Um, you know, once I start actually really detailing a form, I'll end up moving on over, not detailing, but refining my shapes more precisely. I'll move on to the ribbon um, because it is a flattened shape. And so I find that putting that at a, a low level and uh, um, building up on top of the surface is actually um, probably a good way to get more refinement to your forms. And so, especially these early levels, um, it is very smooth, as you can see here. Um, you also at any point in time can go ahead and leave your stats open and take a look at, you know, what, what are you really making here? What, like, what, how much geometry is here? Because two things are going on. I mean, you are actually modifying um, this ADF field, um, but it is also remeshing that field into geometry. And so when I talk to Vil about, you know, how complicated a mesh is, um, I instinctively want to talk about the number of polys that have been remeshed. But what he wants to talk about is um, the number of distance field samples and nodes, uh, because that is really um, the meat of what's going on behind the scenes. And so go ahead and kind of pull that on out. Yeah, you know, and th like that's that's the thing about this is that for me, yeah, being a poly modeler and also, I mean, sculpting, you know, multi-resolution sculpting in particular is something that uh, I do very frequently. And it takes a while to wrap your head around that early when, when you know, uh, when you get started with it. Um, but it's kind of interesting as you start working with the volumetric stuff, it's actually more intuitive um, but you got to break some old habits and make sure you think about this stuff very, very differently. And so let's go ahead and get that on out a little bit more, a little bit more. So how is Florida, Ed? Oh, isn't it always the rainy season? Nice. Yeah, yeah. I moved, as you know, to uh, to Austin, Texas, and everybody kept on telling me, like, "Whoa, be prepared for the heat." And I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." I was just in LA. Oh yeah, I was wrong. I don't have any shorts. I need shorts. Wearing blue jeans does not work here. <laughs> yeah, good call. That's my only shorts I have. But yeah, and it stays hot at night. I mean, it, Austin is an awesome city. I absolutely love it here. Um, but man, this four months of, of summer is no freaking joke. It is brutal. Okay, so as I start getting the digits out, 
before I start really refining the actual palm and all that, um, I'll probably go through and do um, each individual uh, digit on its own just so I get an idea of the shapes that I want. And what's interesting about this is I'll kind of do this as a proof of concept, but I don't usually um, split the hand apart into multiple layers. But for a full body, I usually end up working in a single layer to start off with and, uh, and then splitting it apart after the fact. And you can see what I'm doing here is I end up aligning my view to where I want the actual fingers to extend to. And then I kind of just keep on using the sphere brush to pull it further and further and further towards me and then check it out from another angle and decide how I, I actually feel about that. Yeah, yeah, you pull it out towards you and that's the way you do all the limb structure stuff. If anybody was familiar with... Uh, the early ADF videos from a couple of years ago, um, you know, anything that had any complexity to it, anything that had like limb structures and like branching structures uh, was done in that way. And it's another one of those things where it's a little bit like, oh, well, I, I really don't know how far I'm pulling this out, um, which is slightly frustrating. But in truth, it's just fine because I mean, at any point in time, you can just come here, like raise your smooth amount and just, it's gone. You know, that's what's so cool about this is the lack of preparation. You know, you really don't have to be thinking, you know, 10 steps ahead, which you so frequently do when you're sculpting or modeling using subdivision surfaces or multi-resolution. You can just keep on iterating. And just feel it out. Yes, exactly. And I mean, you, you also, you really need to go ahead and check it out from multiple angles, check out how the shadows look. And that's actually kind of, you know, people are very typically used to a cam uh, basically a camera locked lighting setup. Um, it's a very common way of setting up a viewport. Um, but having the locked lighting and then being able to move your items really quickly and easily is actually really cool because I can constantly change my orientation and get different lighting on it very quickly and very easily and so that's more like what i wanted there because i wanted this pinky digit thing here to uh to come at a sharper angle because that makes a hand look much more natural and realistic and in the case of this one right here you know what i'm not happy with that and I am just going to, just like that one, eliminate it and come at a higher angle. So I want more of a classical look to the um, pose of this hand. Uh, no, you cannot currently, um, but you are able to bring in a reference model and uh, it will actually draw on top of that reference model. And so that's just the way ADFs work typically, period, um, in the sense that like here, just to kind of illustrate this, if I come over here to my layers and uh, if I have this layer selected, it'll nest it, by the way, and I were to say I want a new layer. And so that's an entirely new layer right now. You see, if I stroke on top of it, it's staying constrained to the background surface. And so uh, you are able to produce secondary items that way very quickly and easily. And it's something that we're very curious about exploiting for, you know, designing armor, things of that sort, the stuff that is more or less obvious. Um, but you can't fill it yet. That is definitely one that we are super curious about having. Um, or maybe not necessarily specifically that, but uh, things that would offer similar, similar functionality. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's just not there just yet, but it would be super cool. And I think for um, pretty obvious reasons. And come back here to the tools. Come on over here. And let's take a look at this so that this is a little bit more along the lines. I also need to loosen up a little bit here. 
um, and just get my shapes in place. Because I'm going to end up refining it later anyway. And you know what? I want more. That was a little bit too extreme, so that's probably about right. Now, somebody just made a magical chime next to me, and I have no idea what it is, but it sounded awesome, and it sounded magical. The, there's definitely no genies um, here. I would definitely be supportive of any genies that wanted to appear here to uh, grant me wishes. Not so much. It was, I mean, it was, it was more of the ribbon brush very heavily because I just used that um, heav heavily, but to build that surface up and define my, or not define, but more refine my forms uh, would probably be the more accurate way to put it. And so I'll go ahead and sculpt this out. It actually is with the sphere brush a little bit more challenging to get a precise form because, you know, you've got this rounded shape that's being added onto the surface and being able to deform um, or what do what feels like deforming a surface with the ribbon brush um, for that reason is extremely useful. And so let's go ahead and come on over here, make that on up, and go ahead and pull that on out. Like I said, I need to remind myself to lighten up because I'm not going to refine my forms here at this point. And come on over here. And there you go. So one thing that uh, Ed and I were talking about the other day was our own uh, personal streaming aspirations. Um, I think, uh, you know, this is not an unusual thing these days. Streaming seems incredibly common. Um, I vividly remember being in high school and my friends and I laughing about the fact that um, people actually watch StarCraft competitions. And now stuff like that is unbelievably common. Um, but uh, yeah, I was thinking about actually starting up a VR fitness stream using Beat Saber and some of these other um, applications that are very active in VR. Because I mean, I really strongly believe that the future of fitness is VR. Yeah, just standing there. See, that's the thing. Being a person who sits in front of a computer all day, it's like I, I turned like 38 two years ago. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And uh, I was I, I just realized how out of shape I was. I just couldn't believe it had gone that far. And I'm like, I'm going to start dieting. I need to lose 10 pounds. And it was kind of funny because all of a sudden I lost 10 pounds. And it's like, oh, oh, so that's not enough, huh? And just it kept on going. And at this point, two years later, it's at 40 pounds of fat that's gone. And it's like, yeah, exact, right? You know, it's like, where did that come from? I didn't even know that was there. And it's just, you know, spending 12, 15 years in front of a computer. And, uh, you know, I used to used to go to the gym a lot when I was in my, 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 my mid-20s. And, uh, man, you just get dedicated to 3D and you work your butt off trying to become better at whatever discipline you do and it, you just you lose it all so quickly and it's just it's so easy to um, lose touch with that and so you know I hate cardio I absolutely despise cardio and I you know I, I know a few people who like it but what they like out of it is they they got fairly good at it and they get kind of a buzz from it you know they get this rush understandably um, but it's so hard to get to that point and have faith in getting to that point and I find that uh, the VR side of things, if I have to do cardio, like hopping on a treadmill, it's like, all right, I did 15 minutes, I'm satisfied myself. But in VR, if it's a game like Beat Saber, and I'm, you know, maybe taking it a little bit further to really accentuate uh, the physical activity that could be part of it, um, I'll spend 30 minutes or 45. How long did you spend, Joe? Joe's, yeah, huh? Two hours. Two hours. Joe spent two hours. Yeah. Joe, you don't have a Fitbit, do you, Joe? 
You need to get a Fitbit. You need to. Okay, we're gonna update you on Joe's progress. Joe streams on on Twitch. He does some pretty great streams, and uh, he has lived working, unlike me. Uh, but uh, yeah, he does some Beat Saber streams and spent two hours in there. That's the thing is, you put the thing on, and you're like, I'm gonna do ten minutes of this, and then way more time passes, and I lost uh, what four pounds in ten days, basically doing that. See, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to claim Jedi status yet, but it's it's gonna happen. Uh, I'm pretty certain of it. Uh, I'm definitely feeling the force. Uh, yeah. See, that's the thing is, like, I don't know if I want to stream myself because I act like a silly idiot. Like, it is so ridiculous. Like, all these ridiculous flares. It's like this is stuff that like would have socially just destroyed you 20 years ago you would have never recovered from it you know and so i still have that like oh my god you can't do this this is this is not acceptable um but it's fun and it's uh it's healthy and it's pretty cool that you know those of us who've been involved in uh an industry like this that is so notoriously sedentary um now are, are involved in technologies that are, are are the complete opposite they're highly active and you know VR, while it has um, you know a, a long way to go and a lot of different respects. I mean, every aspect of VR, the support hardware, the actual physical VR hardware itself, um, all has a long way to develop. Um, but it's already super practical and can um, alter the way that you work um, in multiple ways, whether or not that's you know um, fitness or that's actually sculpting, etc. Um, I can't wait until we get better controllers, which seems like every month I see some new brilliant controller idea, which is extremely exciting. I have not read any news on that, um, but it's cool. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, the touch controllers from Oculus are awesome. I, uh, you know, I've been impressed at the level of articulation. We've actually been doing some experiments with that. With Moto VR, I'm um, looking at you know how you can use some of the like controls that are present um, for you know pointing and and almost even grasping and stuff like that. It's really neat. Um, and yeah, that's definitely a good a great example of you know where things are going. But man, I mean, at some point you, you gotta you know just extrapolate on where the technology can go, and at some point it should maybe be able to track your physical hands. You know. And even ideas as far as gloves that maybe even give you feedback, stuff like that. It's a it's a pretty awesome bright future, I think. Well, that that can already be done, sorta. Um, people are using a tool for Skyrim that can do that. Um, so if you want to use a particular spell, you can just speak, and it will use that spell. So that's definitely possible. What I've been wondering about is in professional situations is how could you make something like that work where, you know, it's like you can't have, you know, 20 people in a room and, you know, half of them are yelling different commands. That would totally throw me off. Um, but like sub vocal, like if you could have something attached to your throat, so you could just, you know, say it almost under your breath and still have the same thing um, happen. But it seems like this is all developing in that direction and so let's go ahead and go on over i i um i kind of hate you um <laughs> no it's a, a yeah i mean bike powered workstation yeah all sorts of crazy ideas really i just can't wait until the hardware is you know almost like putting on a pair of glasses it is. Yep. No, I, you know, it's funny. Like initially too, I was, you know, something resembling a naysayer um, regarding VR because I just really couldn't imagine people going through the trouble, um, especially in a professional capacity. Like, you know, like, am I really going to go through all the hassle? Because I mean, we're talking about devices hooked up to your computer, which I mean, Really, that's all you should have to say about potential problems. You know, like uh, everybody has issues with, you know, their microphones or their speakers and stuff like that. And it's just like, ah, oh, is every is anybody really going to care about this? And then, you know, I finally tested it out. I'm like, this is amazing. 
And then it's like, all right, you know, I, I'll invest in it, and I got it, and now it's like, oh man, this has this is a bright future. It's certainly um, currently challenging because of control structures more than anything else, but it really is a very bright future technologically as far as letting us, you know, um, escape the idea of working through a window on a desktop. All right, so let's go ahead and go on over to this ribbon brush. I'm not happy with the shape just yet, but it's the right time to start figuring that out. And so, you know, it's probably gonna end up a little bit lumpy, but I'm gonna end up having to retopo something like this anyway. And I don't know if you notice, but the feel of it is definitely very different. And I find I do lots and lots of circular strokes and kind of producing lumps and filling in spaces between them. And the reason for that, that I can kind of, you know, uh, actually almost even get a little bit more shadow and shading information on there. It's, uh, I mean, even, uh, you know, for, you know, to be talking about a sculpting application is almost a dirty word right now, but, you know, that's exactly what I do in ZBrush, uh, too, is I go ahead and let my models be uh, rough uh, because I find I can read them better. Um, when they are too smooth, it is hard to really understand your forms. And so at this point, we'll just go ahead and start trying to understand structurally what is happening here. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it is, it is, I don't know. I, I can't believe I took to it as much. I was really enjoying being the guy who, you know, would be like, actually, I don't think it's going to work out, but it's, no, well, it's more fun being wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, dude. That was an amazing presentation, by the way. That was such a good job, Ed. It really, that's probably part of the reason why you work with us now. Um, that, that was an amazing presentation. It was incredible. That's the thing is you, you, you're like, okay, I get it. I see the future of what this could be here. And everybody has the same ideas. And that's the, you know, a lot of our discussions about VR tools and stuff. I mean, it, you know, it's amazing how often the same things end up getting repeated. Um, and I think that isn't a negative. It's not like, oh, well, you know, there aren't ideas, new ideas to have with it. It's just that you, I mean, it's obvious the ways that this can be exploited and the ways that it can be advantageous. I just, you know what I really want, and this is something that we, you know, we've only seen little bits of talk about, is I want a stylus in a VR space, and that's something that is, you know, obviously highly hardware dependent, but I would love to have a drawing tablet that is trackable in space and then be able to control a cursor. The, sta the standalone stylus or the one with the actual tablet along with it? Because I saw that was a standalone stylus. Yeah, which was cool. Well, yeah, because you could still get the pressure sensitivity, you know. And I find even if I'm if I'm sculpting in VR uh, in Canova, um, I spend my first thirty minutes to an hour on my feet. I may be overstating, um, but getting out proportions, like working on that little dwarf character, is like perfect to be able to stand there and be like, "All right, I want a dwarf. Let's make sure he fits the proportions relative to me." Uh, but then from that point forward, even while I was in VR, I'm sitting here, you know, at my chair working um, and it's like, hey, you know what? I'd love to have my tablet sitting on my lap the way that I have right now and, uh, and just be continuing to work with this. You know, like I think there's an opportunity there that I'm curious to see any hardware makers uh, take advantage of it. Because even with drawing tablets and I mean, I think anybody who's been involved in this industry for a while, um, I mean, you just become so accustomed to them. But do you remember the first time you saw a drawing tablet? What was your reaction to it at the time? Oh. oh. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, mine was like, the first one I saw, I guess, was like an Intuos 1. 
Um, I don't even think they had, I'm pretty sure they didn't have Cintiqs. I remember, I think, I think I remember when Cintiqs came out and it was like, oh my God, I have to have that. And no, I can't afford that. Interesting. Well, I mean, my first reaction to drawing tablets, and actually, you know, as in college, I, I had one, and I was, I was still getting used to it because I had gotten used to sculpting with a mouse. In fact, back in my, like, early mud box days, I sculpted with a mouse. I mean, like, my first, like, 10 sculpts were all done with a mouse because it took time to get used to the idea of a stylus and a tablet, and especially having something that you're, you're not looking at, but you're watching the screen and just getting used to that, that motion. But all my friends would come in, they'd see this tablet and they're like, is that really useful? Like, you know, I, you know, I can't imagine that being useful because you don't look at it, you know, a Cintiq, a little bit more straightforward as far as, you know, um, you know, a, a third party looking at it and saying, oh, I see the usefulness of that. But, you know, it's like just from the third party perception, looking at somebody else using a, a tablet like an Intuos, you know, a lot of people look at it and say, ah, you know, is that really useful? And you have to try it first. And then you realize, oh, this is indispensable. And I mean, you know, you can take away my cigarettes. Don't take away my tablet. Like that, that's, that's not going to go well. That will make me a very angry person. That would be more jarring to my life than anything else. Yeah, I broke my Intuos once. I ordered one off of Prime Now that same day. I was like, I couldn't deal. It wasn't even like I could wait two more days, you know, to order, you know, just online through Amazon. I had to have it in two hours. There was no, I was like, I was going to travel if that wasn't an option. Yeah, absolutely. Could not agree more. All right, so as you can see, what I'm doing is very loosely. I've uh, you know I've gotten my basic shapes in place. I'm not happy with the uh, the form structures anatomically at all. But what I'm doing is I'm going through, and from my perspective, I'm deforming the model. Now, in truth, I am not. What I'm doing is I am adding more clay, but very softly, very lightly, and uh, and trying to get these nuance these uh, forms into uh, more structural anatomical forms and it's starting to resemble a hand beginning to yeah i haven't gotten onto my blobby approach just yet now if you notice i haven't gotten down into a really small brush just yet now you have uh you've done a lot of uh desktop sculpting on canova ed yeah. What, what was what was your takeaway from that? What were, what were some of the ways that you like to work? That's interesting. Uh, you know, I gotta say, uh, for those of you who don't like that Canova has Moto style navigation, totally my fault. Um, Cause I love it. And I was like, oh, please add Moto style navigation. One of the things that we are, uh, we are talking about, of course, is alternative navigation styles. Um, we do think that is very important just for, uh, you know, anybody who is not a Moto user and doesn't use Moto style navigation, um, uh, you know, coming over to Canova, we want you to be comfortable. So we are looking at alternate uh, nav navigation styles. But, um, you know, one thing uh, as I'm working here, if you notice, I get around the viewport really fast. Um, that's partly due to familiarity with this navigation style, because that's the way it's just going to be. Uh, one of our one of our uh, salespeople 
Ken always says, hey, look, the best tool in the world is the tool you know best. Um, and there's so much truth to that. Um, but it's also just because the navigation style on Moto is fast. Things like trackball rotation are absolutely spectacular. And I know people hate it. And by the way, when I first started using Moto a long time ago in version one, I turned off trackball rotation for everything. And I switched over to Maya style navigation because that's what I was, I was accustomed to. And then I started working here and Shane uh, said, hey, can you make a Moto style navigation video for us? And it's like, ah, oh, dude, you totally know what you just did. And that was, hey, make us a video because we want you to use that style. And uh, as I started using it, uh, I actually, he didn't tell me to. He didn't say, hey, afterwards, you have to do this. He just said, hey, make a video for us on it. And so after making the video, I was comfortable with it and I just kept on using it. And I found, all right, you know what? I'm actually gonna use the Moto style, which is Alt for rotate, Alt plus control for zoom and uh, um, Alt plus shift for pan. And uh, it actually is extremely fast. Um, I find it uh, easier, especially when using a stylus um, than having mouse centric motion because uh, mouse-centric motion, the way that I have my stylus uh, set up or button-centric motion, um, it would be really annoying because you have to be able to hit left, right click, and med middle click. And middle click, I go ahead and add to uh, one of the buttons on the stylus. This is nauseating. <laughs> At first, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like centipede. Same here, and actually, I, I even in Moto, I use the throw option, which nobody seems to use that one at all, where you can you know throw tumble it in space. I don't use the wobble feature. I, that one's I don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, it is fun. It's I mean, it, uh, the thinking behind it was you know like so many things in in Moto, absolutely brilliant. Which was like, well, you probably want to look at this from you know a couple angles, you know, but it, for some reason, it just didn't embed into my processes and i remember i was talking to james guard very talented moto artist uh working on a really great project right now um and uh he was asking about something i'm like oh yeah and i started showing it to him and he's like oh my god you actually use that that trackball throw thing you're like why do you do that and it's like it's awesome that's why i feel like i feel like a superhero is why but seriously Yeah, no, it's one of the things that absolutely drives me nuts uh, in other applications is the that the lack of trackball rotation. Because, I mean, the way that I even I draw, I I, I draw incorrectly. Um, you know, I constantly am moving my my page um, around. I really never was able to gain the articulation where it's like, okay, this thing is up is is, is sitting straight up and down, and I I can make any form I want while it's in that position. That just didn't work for me. Um, and so trackball rotation for me is like, all right, get the actual item into the orientation I want it to be in and then use strokes that I'm extremely comfortable with. And so it seemed like a much more natural way of working once I got familiar with it. But it was a commitment though. You know, you got to actually say, I'm going to sit down and spend a day doing, doing it this way. Sure. Oh, I remember leaving Lightwave. I love Lightwave's navigation style. I can't stand that navigation style now. Yeah. yeah it's like that navigation style was the first one I was inter introduced to, really, um, you know, for a, you know, a full-fledged application. But no, I, I, mem I remember, you know, before I worked here, there were a couple projects where that I had to go over to Lightwave on, and I was an unpleasant person to be around when that happened.
yeah, trying to get the shapes I want, especially for a certain limpness. And it's starting to get into the shapes that I want. It's not quite right yet. And go ahead and undo that. By the way, undo speed improved dramatically uh, with the build that we released this week. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I broke I broke Canova with uh, um, with the dwarf. Um, I couldn't open it anymore, and uh, and so like I'm like Phil, it, it's not working. Like I, I it just it just won't launch. And, and he's like, oh okay, let me see the file. And he's like, oh, it's over two gigabytes. There's a there's an aspect in there that says don't load it if it's over two gigabytes. <laughs> and so he just yeah, so he just removed that uh, that requirement. But now that file is under a gig. And so it went from I think uh, like I think 2.6 down to one gigabyte, and so he's really absolutely killing it on the work that he's doing to refine this application and, and refine what is I mean ultimately this is challenging technology. I mean you know volumetric stuff is it's not inherently new. Um, it's something that has been around for a long time, but it's never really truly caught on and been developed in the way that, say, subdivision surface modeling has been well refined over, you know, 20 plus years at this point, right? And so what he's doing is just blows my mind every time I see it and uh, wish I knew how to do one tenth of what that man is capable of. Oh. I just wish he was meaner. Um, cause he's just, he's just too freaking nice. Yep. Oh man, every time I, like, week by week, it's nice to see the progress. This is, uh, uh. It just doing so much better uh, performance-wise than it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Leaps and bounds of improvements. Yes, actually, I would uh, block out the actual palm shape, and then I would do uh, the fingers on the desktop side, interestingly enough, because I actually had a harder time um, getting the types of forms I wanted in VR. And so, you know, you end up having to do, go through this refinement process, which you can do in VR, but um, I found I had a harder time understanding what was going on. And so that's why I like blocking out my forms in VR, then hopping into desktop, refining those forms, and then actually for that third stage going back and forth, because there's a lot of areas where VR is extremely useful um for you know continue just being able to like reach around and things of that sort um or like say i'm working on a helmet and it's like i've been working on, the, on that as a solid you know volume that uh it, you know a person couldn't wear because it it's completely solid and then hopping into vr and carving that out um in vr because that's something that i'd have to constantly be rotating around and looking from every angle and refining and refining and refining on the desktop side when in vr it took all of you know like two minutes Mm-hmm. Yep. Bingo. That's the way to go with it. Make an armature. I mean, it's a base mesh, essentially. That is starting to get there. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, it adds resolution. Um, so I'd rather, or it can add resolution. Um, so I'd rather wait until the end for that. Um, also, uh, Vil has, um, for that, just recently added an improvement that allows you to to actually essentially fill color, which wasn't present before. So you could actually, you know, change the color for an entire layer at once. Uh, which is yes, yeah, so you don't have to go through and paint the whole thing. I've actually been surprised at what you can pull off with the with the painting in Canova. It's pretty amazing. And it's essentially the same as. Uh, by the way, this is anytime I say something 
uh, you know, the same as it's always from an artist perspective type thing. It's not the technological perspective, uh, but it's very similar to vertex maps, you know, because your color is actually being, um, you know, applied based on the resolution of the surface itself. Okay, so let's go ahead and come on in here. And there we go. And let's take a quick, quick, quick look at this. And see in wireframe mode what is going on here, almost just so that you guys see. You see? Pretty interesting how resolution is applied and my brush got a lot smaller. And so here we are, we've got a higher resolution, but that resolution is fairly uniform, right? And so what it is, what's going on is as you, you, we have these multiple levels of resolution that the brush size itself is controlling. And so uh, it's something, you know, definitely to keep in mind. And it's another reason why it's very worthwhile to go ahead and keep uh, checking out the wireframe so you understand really what is happening there. Uh, not how it influences the surface, uh, but it, it could affect how your new stroke merges with the uh, the existing surface. Um, so you know if if you if there's a big difference between the resolution of the surface and your current stroke, then yeah, you'll probably see a bigger difference. But um, if uh, if they match, if your brush size is the re resolution of the area that you're working on. Uh, then it is going to uh, be a little bit smoother. You're not going to see as much divoting, as much terracing. So go ahead and come on around there. Oops. Yeah, did not want to hit that. Man, Phil really did improve undo pretty dramatically. Uh, I mentioned, oh, I, I, I hit control, and so I did a subtractive operation instead of smoothing. I didn't hit shift. Yeah, and so. You know, there's only one thing missing, and that is the Tron soundtrack. It seems like that's what I listen to 30% of the time while I'm working. Recently, or I mean, Daft Punk is, is just a good call in general. But, uh,. Recently, been listening to a lot of Imagine Dragons, and because of Beat Saber, yes. Oh my God! Well, uh, it's it's a it's a custom track on on Beat Saber, and so you know it's not part of the native game, but people have been making custom tracks, and that's one one of the ones that I've been doing for uh, for my cardio stuff. And it's pretty great. But somebody also just came out with Ganyam style. Yeah, and it was like unavoidable. You played it, right, Joe? Not yet. Not yet? Oh, okay. All right. So the way that the the blocks are arranged, it makes you do that freaking dance. It, well, it, it 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 puts the colors on opposite sides and makes you cross your arms, and and then it, it's coming at the correct beats per minute, right? And so, I mean, it's everybody who's tried it out has had the same reaction. There's even a thread in the Beat Saber discussion forums about, like, I played this and I didn't realize it until halfway through and I started just cracking up. It's hilarious. That one, I will not be streaming. That's, that would be, I can take, take that. No way. Who? Oh, no. Oh, oh I, th I thought you were talking about Brandon. Okay. <laughs> yes, Ace would be good at that. I'm sorry I ever did that, but it was on Mixamo's site. It was so great, though, when I saw that. I was like, ah, oh, I need, I just need a, a mocap file for this video. And then it was just like Ganyam style. Oh, yeah. No, this is going to be, this is going to be great. Yeah, it is forever burned into my memory as well. You folks at uh, Mixmo enjoyed that when we were demoing at their booth at GDC that year.
Good people. Woo. So what time is it, Ed? Okay, yeah, that's, yep. I'll do that conversion, it's all good. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit longer because I do just want to get this a little bit further along. I am not happy with this, but I do need to run to the bathroom. Could you do me a favor, Ed, and could you pull up um, some of William's videos, like maybe a playlist I could play while we just take a five minute break? Uh, just just go on YouTube and uh, find a playlist of uh, moto videos I could run. Okay. Preferably from Pixel Fondue, since they are the great people that are uh, doing this for us. For us, yeah. Preferably one that is about five minutes long. There you go. Yeah, if you can do that, and we can just run that really quickly, because, I mean, you can't go wrong showing William's videos. In fact, I mean, those of you who do know me, um, at uh, trade shows, usually do a moto presentation, and uh, last year, I just basically ended up totally just <laughs> using all of William's stuff, um, just because it's that good. I mean, it's just amazing. It shows moto in the best light possible and uh shows the ways that you can customize it and i thought that was pretty cool that you know was able to use williams videos um to really articulate what's great about moto because nobody can compete with how well he shows that cool beautiful yeah because i uh you know this is running a little bit over. I'd say, given the late start, we're probably close to at an hour right now. But I'd like to put in another 15, 20 minutes and get these fingers a little bit more refined. So temporarily, what we're going to do is just run um, a couple of videos really quickly and take a five-minute break from the sculpting. And, uh, and then we will come right back to this. And so let me go ahead and reset that. That's starting to come together. It's, it's, eh, meh, meh. Uh, yeah. Hey, don't forget the, the fact that I totally screwed up the MR stuff and uh, <laughs> have to on the fly re re uh, uh, cover for that. Um, yeah, let's not talk about that. I'll just, I'll just bring that up, even though I probably shouldn't. And so let's go ahead and reset that layer and. Oh yeah, it goes back to its original position. Oh no, it's wonderful. In fact, I've been using it to re just record um, essentially screen screen grabs, and I'm showing. I hope you didn't say. Yep. <laughs> hey Greg, is everything cool? There's nothing bad going on. All right, get rid of these. And all right, well, let's go ahead and play all. There we go. And we'll full screen that, and I will be right back, guys.
All right, well, that one ended. How's it going, everybody? No. No one can hear you? Really? Oh, jeez. That is awful. Yeah, the desktop audio is not piping through in OBS. So you're hearing half of our conversation. Ugh, this has been a debacle. Please bear with us, guys. I'm very sorry for the multitude of problems that have been going on here. Because um, it's turned on. And it's just not getting your audio, your desktop audio at all. That is super frustrating. Were you able to hear William's videos? Not at all. Huh. Ah. Uh, no, that's great. Thank you, Ed. Ed is saying lots of awesome, smart things. Um, just uh, for more information on what Ed's been saying. Uh, next week will go much more smoothly, I promise. I think I might have a drink tonight, maybe. Or two. It's true. It's true. I don't have my improv class tomorrow, which uh, has been very entertaining. Uh, Ed just asked if I was really in an improv class, and yes, I really am in an improv class. I figured I needed extracurricular activities that didn't involve a computer. And so I started taking improv classes, and it's it's a bunch of, like, grown-ups behaving like, well, just like like children. It's uh, it's interesting. It's definitely a good departure. It's, it's weird when uh, your hobby becomes your career uh, because when it's your hobby I mean it's what you do all the time and that's the way it was for, for 3D in general for me you know it's like I was very determined to be a modeler and uh, so all I did all the time was modeling and then I got a job doing it and I went I would go home and do the same thing again and for years and years and years you gotta find uh a way to diversify yourself. In fact, uh, Greg uh, Loomberger and I were talking yesterday and uh, when he hopped on and he mentioned, I just got back from the gym and I gotta say, the uh, one of the most important things um, that I have not done for most of my career that has kind of been something I've been doing for the past year um, is exercising every day and has had a tremendous impact um, because you can't just be in front of the computer and another buddy of mine, Jaunty, uh, who I was talking to today, he uh, he said uh, basically, you know, he's like, I sit at a desk in a chair. I am chairman. That is what I excel at. And I understand that uh, that experience very well. Um, and it's something that you, you got to find a, a way around it because it's uh, you know, people are meant to move. They're meant to be active. And it, you know, after a decade, which was my case of being sedentary, it has a horrific toll and one that takes a very long time to recover from. Um, and you're better off doing that as early as possible. And yes, uh, Ed just asked if I have considered a standing desk and sure I have I, I you know that I hear it's a lot healthier um, the way that I use my tablet though I, I don't put it on a desktop I uh, I have it in my lap I cross my legs and I have it sitting on my lap and I lean back uh, so I am the most comfortable and so while working yeah I like to be sitting but um, you know uh, the standing desk thing that's certainly I don't think standing is a replacement for exercise uh, it's probably healthier for a lot of reasons um, but uh, I think the whole exercise thing is super, super important. And the cardio thing, I mean, cardio is something that I and so many people hate um, is super important. And I avoided the cardio thing at first. I just started lifting weights a year ago and the cardio thing uh, has been off and on. But 
VR has gotten me more interested in cardio and doing 30 minutes a day of cardio is seriously life altering. Um, it, uh, it feels great. I mean, there's all these studies talking about um, the positive psychological benefits that it has. I think it just gets your body moving. And so many of the talented artists that I know do take time for exercise. People like Greg, you know, and people like, uh, like Rich Fury, if you see his Facebook posts, I mean, like he's running, I mean, pretty frequently. I think last, well, last weekend he did like six miles one day. And then you talk about William, <laughs> like William is, William's an athlete, like a serious athlete. Like he does ultra marathons. That's crazy. And that's, you know, that was actually one of the things that, um, you know, really motivated me to try and do the more cardio is, you know, when you hear that somebody as prolific as William takes the time to exercise every day and manages to do everything else he does, you know, it, you have to ask a question and you have to ask yourself like, well, is this improving his ability to work? And I don't know. I mean, that'd be for William to answer, but from my experience, I think probably yes. Um, you know, it, I believe it. I, you know, like when I, when I lift, I, uh, you know, I, ca I don't use anything to count in between my sets and I just, I count. And so it's meditative and it clears your head out. You find something else to focus your attention on. That's nothing. And then, yeah, you end up working out issues associated with your day-to-day -day work. And, uh, you know, when you get as good as William is, you can just think about Moto and think about a workflow in Moto and then come back to it after you're done doing your other things and then test it out again. But uh, it gives you more endurance. Um, sitting in front of the computer for a decade will rob you of endurance and motivation. Uh, there's been some talk about uh, things like that, that there's no commitment on a feature of that sort. That would be super cool. Um, you know, uh, there, yeah, we're not committing to anything like that just yet. But yeah, the, I mean, the thing about uh, Canova and ADF technology in general is that when we were brainstorming on feature ideas, um, we found that part really easy. Uh, it was really easy to come up with you know, like, oh man, you know, this technology could be used in this way or this way or this way or this way. And of course, at that point, I mean, you're just, you're just, you know, coming up with so many features, there's no way you'd ever have a product come out. Um, but we've got a very long list of things that we want. And uh, we are very receptive to ideas that other people have. And as the application matures, I'm sure that you'll see more things of that sort. Um, our focus right now is making this into a good sculptor. And the first initial priorities are, or the highest priorities are performance, uh, which we have made quite a bit of headway on, but we also are, are very straightforward about, we need more and we're working on ways to get more. And then quality too, like you'll, you'll see the divoting and glitching triangles um, as I sculpt. And uh, that, is, that is frustrating to people, especially people who are new to it. But these are things that we are definitely tackling and making uh, some very good progress on. Uh, but once we really nail all that down, um, then we get to go and start having fun with all sorts of stuff. Um, a big one for me is I want, you know, and I'm saying more than I should here and might get in trouble for this. So I will clarify very specifically, these are, none of these things are features we're committing to um, for a version one or anything else. But I, I would love to use it for kit bashing, you know, import meshes and be able to, you know, merge those meshes together or Boolean layers together and things of that sort. And, uh, you know, this is probably with this product, um, one of the first times I've been more involved on the product side of things. And, you know, Shane gets a lot of crap on the forums sometimes. And, you know, I understand the perspective of being a user and having a piece of software that lets you do all this wonderful stuff and, you know, you wanting to see more out of it, but being in a position, in the position of a guy like Shane, who, you know, needs to make sure that things continue moving forward. It's not a fun job. It's, uh, you have to make decisions that it's like, but I really, really wanted this, but we've got to fix this instead first. And so you've got to be very practical about it. And, uh, it's, 
it's challenging. And the one thing I do want to, you know, re reiterate to anybody who is watching this, you know, developing software, um, we all love this stuff, you know, the technology behind it, 3D in general. I mean, Shane worked as an artist. He worked as also um, managing, you know, art departments and stuff. He's very familiar. Um, and it's one of these things where it's hard to make these decisions, but that's how you keep everything moving forward. And I would say that Moto 12 is a great example of that. Um, you know, that, that, that consistent dedication to that type of philosophy, because you, over time, you end up with something that ha suddenly matures into something extraordinarily robust. And, uh, you know, Moto 10, 11, and 12, I think illustrate that really well. Boy, I'm sure gonna have some editing to do to this video when it's done. Ed is using medical terminology for anatomy. Um, there was a time in my life when I did, or tried is what I should say. And I mean, I actually even carried around a sketchbook for a couple of years that was anatomical drawings and get weird looks from my professors, you know, cause they were like, seriously, this is what you're spending your time on. Um, it's valuable, but you end up just forgetting this stuff. But that's amazing, Ed, that you, uh, you have taken the time to really learn um, the fine um, anatomical naming conventions. And I want to get that right down. You do. It's, it's yeah, f yeah. For the most part, I remembered actually all the bones of the human body for years. I had an amazing life science teacher in eighth grade. And he did an incredible job of of uh, getting us to remember all of those things, like you know, really clever ways, like you know, like uh, your tibia. Uh, oh man, now I'm gonna mess it up. It's tibia and fibula, I think. But it's like little clever ways of remembering them, like big tib, little fib, and stuff like that. Still remember that from eighth grade. Yeah. Sorry, man, no answers for you on that. Um, what we are focused on, and that question has been asked many, many times, and I expect it to be asked uh, many times more. By the way, the question was, will this be um, a part of Moto in the future? Um, don't know. Uh, my, uh, you know, right now we are focused on Canova as a standalone application. Uh, my personal feelings on that, and this is not necessarily the company feeling or anything of that sort, um, is that I think it's best off being focused on as a dedicated application uh, for now, uh, because we get to focus on making something that's really good at sculpting. Um, when in the case of Moto, we, you know, we have to focus on so many other aspects. I personally would like to see um, Moto and Canova work nicely together um, because there's a lot of things that for any sculpting workflow that you're going to need uh, another application for, uh, you know, topology, for instance, like with, with Moto um, would be absolutely huge. You know, if you wanted to take your model and rig it up, of course, you're going to take it into a, a, um, a full featured 3D application. And uh, I'd rather see Canova develop on its own and improve its connections to Moto and even maybe look at, you know, things that, you know, could be improved in Moto to improve workflow with Canova. And I think that would probably lead to the strongest suite of tools that way. Um, but who knows? Um, you know, it's one of these things that everybody seems interested in, and I'm sure we're going to keep on hearing it from people. So. Uh, you know, definitely talked about, um, it, it's, uh, I, I don't know how necessarily how high that is on the priority list per se. Um, you know, we really want to focus on again, making this a great sculptor first, but it is a feature that, uh, definitely, um, you know, is something that is being considered by the way, here's something, an interesting point here, right? I'm going to undo this and come back and you see things are a little bit jaggy, a little bit wonky. And what I'm doing is I am using the sphere brush in negative mode. And actually, I'm going to switch over to ribbon because I really don't want to be using sphere right now. Um, but 
in subtractive mode, if I if also if I take a look at excuse me view and come over here to my wireframe, see things are pretty uniform but fairly scattered. Um, and I come back over here and turn that off. Now, if I come over this, you'll notice you'll see like some of those jaggies disappearing, and that ends up happening as you end up using a large brush over many areas um, because then you're kind of almost equalizing the resolution between multiple layers. Okay, and it's not so bad. You know, one thing I love about Texas is how good the air conditioning is in every building in Texas. It's brutal outside. It really is. Uh, that, you know, it's something that we have discussed. Um, we kind of questioned the value of it um, in the short term. Maybe that has more value later. Um, but we kind of decided that people, for the most part, are going to go with their dominant hand. And then also, you probably want to have um, access to controls on the opposite hand. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things to consider there. But um, also, frequently, you spend a lot of your time in symmetry. You might come out later. I guess painting is a fairly good argument since that would be something you do in the late stage anyway. Um, but yeah, we've, we've decided to focus on one controller at a time for now um, because, uh, yeah, for the most part, people are going to be using one controller. But it is something that we have discussed and think is a pretty good idea for the future. Being able to use both hands, it would definitely make things more tangible. It would remind me of the days of... Uh, working with clay. In fact, I did bring it up when we were early in development because uh, my high school sculpture teacher, Gershon Rappaport, amazing man, um, taught me how to sculpt a face uh, with like a really interesting workflow for discovering um, facial forms. And it was, I mean, I can't show it to you right now. Maybe I'll try and emulate it next week um, while we do well, I got the VR stuff working again. Um, but it was really cool. Like you put your palms, or your, you, you get an egg shape for a head, right? And you kind of slap that on top of a cylinder for a neck. And you pound that into shape with some paddles to get it to a little bit better of a shape. But then you place your hands on the sides of the head with your thumbs pointing towards each other. And you find the area you want to be the eyes. And then you hollow out the eyes with your thumbs. And you reach into those eye sockets and you dig out behind and then pull that clay where the nose would be, pull it out towards you, and then you push it on the sides, and you slide outwards to define the cheekbones, and then down. And it's like and it's just a series of motions that were like kung fu that you would use to um, rough out the shape of a head, and it made you know sculpting a head so much easier to understand. It's absolutely brilliant. So it was one of the things I was thinking about um, when we were talking about using multiple hands um, for workflows, but in the case of digital sculpture, you know, uh, you know, I, the way that I handle things these days is if I'm sculpting a head, 90% of the time I'm going to be in symmetry. And then towards the end, when I'm detailing, I'll step outside of symmetry and start, you know, randomizing things a little bit and give almost the illusion of less symmetry. Um, so it would be fun. The potter's wheel stuff, like the, the turntable, um, that could be super interesting. Uh, but it, it, for digital sculpting, it almost increases a degree of error in a way, you know? Okay. Yeah, we'll go ahead and get this on out a little bit further. And I think I'm going to pretty soon have to just call it on this. And again, folks, thank you for dealing with my mistakes that are my fault. And, uh, Definitely not the fault of the wonderful people at Pixel Fondue who are allowing us to stream on their channel. Which, of course, uh, the first day I do that, I screw it up. That's what I do. And we'll get Ed piped through. You just worked last time uh, when we did it. Like, uh, And it's not a problem with streaming on YouTube. It's a problem 
uh, for some reason, OBS, it's set to detect my desktop audio, but it isn't. And OBS, for those who you don't know, is Open Broadcaster. It is, uh, there's many variants, it's open source, um, but it's used for streaming, and I also use it for general video recording, a lot of people do. Um, but there's other versions of OBS out there, like there's like Streamlabs OBS, which is really cool. And uh, it's, I mean, for, for recording, it's 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 amazing you know i used to use some other dedicated screen capture software and these days i just use open broadcaster and uh and premiere you know for my quick editing at the end lots of options for configuration which i definitely like Uh, it doesn't snap to your hand. Okay, so uh, well, there's some nuances here. Um, do you mean you want to just be depressing the button and when you let go, it drops it? Is that what you're asking for? Oh, okay, Eugene. Okay, Eugene um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Ed just relayed your question to me. Um, so are you asking uh, as far as using multiple hands, being able to hold an item with one hand, where you want to, when you depress the button, um, that means you're holding on to it. And then when you let go of the button, that means you've dropped it, you've let go of it. Is that what you're asking? Cool. The reason why I ask is currently um, you use an inside grip button to grab a hold of an item and you just click it once and it's, it's grabbed a layer or a, a group of layers, including the nested layers or parented layers. And, uh, and then you hit the button again to drop it. And uh, you know, that's something that we've discussed quite a bit is which behavior we want. Um, we ended up going with clicking the button once to grab a hold of a layer or a group of layers and then clicking it again to drop it as opposed to keeping it depressed to maintain holding on to it. Um, but uh, let us know by all means, Eugene, uh, if you can clarify whether or not that's what you meant. Okay, I hear you, man. Totally do. Um, so that's a big one for you, is it? Um, you know what? Uh, it would be great. Um, Eugene, uh, are you on Steam and are you familiar with our discussion forums? Uh, it would be great if you could hop into the Canova discussion forums on Steam and start a thread on that. Um, love to hear more on what you have to say about it and what other people have to say about it. But that is something that is worth a discussion for sure. Um, and... I personally, I like uh, the idea of, you know, just grabbing and dropping in the manner that you're talking about, um, but then holding on to it has some advantages too. It's something that we'd almost like to give options on, uh, but it is interesting to hear what you had to say about that, and I'd like to know more about what other people say too. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Canova's on. Okay, so Ed just told me he was trying to drop the discussion forums link, and they won't let him um, on YouTube, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, what we'll do is, uh, when we post on the Luxology forums and the various other places, uh, you know, uh, about the recording of this stream and access to it, we'll make sure people know where that discussion forum is. Um, if you have Steam, Eugene, um, just tell Ed whether or not you have Steam or not. Um, it's in the discussion forums for Canova, and it would be great to have uh, an expanded discussion on that because we do want to give you guys what you want, but at the same time, we also need to have something resembling a consensus on ideas like that. All right. It's Memorial Day weekend this weekend, isn't it? Yeah, they have a bank holiday. Yeah, and so that should make for a fun weekend. Austin is definitely a celebratory town. What were you going to say, Ed? Okay, cool. Yeah, please, if you can hop in there and do that, that would really be great. Yeah, 
It really is. I, I really, I mean, I love California. It is great. It's just rough living in uh, in L.A. just because cost of living. And uh, Austin is culturally quite similar. It is very fun place to be. And so I definitely like it here. But L.A. is so great. And San Francisco is too. What? What's up, Ed? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, you nailed it right there. The barbecue here is pretty much without parallel. There's actually one place, and uh, before I moved here, because we, we do have an office here, and uh, you know our team here in Austin would visit LA quite a bit. Um, and the last time that everybody visited was for SIGGRAPH last year. And when they came, I was telling a, a friend of mine uh, from here in Austin, I'm like, oh, there's this amazing restaurant here. Really want to take you there. It's extraordinary. And she's like, oh, okay, well, what kind of food is it? I'm like, it's barbecue. And she's like, uh, -uh no, absolutely not. I am not eating LA barbecue. I'm from Austin. And she's got a point. But see, here's the thing. The guy who opened this restaurant in LA, this barbecue restaurant is from Austin. And so it's like, you know, it's like I found this amazing barbecue in LA and it's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. This is actually really Texas barbecue. That's a lot more expensive um, in LA. And uh, barbecue is a religious experience. Yeah, there's this one place here. I keep on forgetting the name of it. Joe, what's the name of the place that there's a little line every day? Oh, um... Can't remember. Okay, Joe can't remember the name. There's this one barbecue place that's super famous here. And they're, like, only open a couple hours a day. And when they open, there's already a line and, to get barbecue. And then when they run out, it doesn't matter if you're still on the line. You just leave. And this... This, this barbecue restaurant has been able to sustain themselves despite this, and uh, it's that good. People are completely willing to accept it. It's Franklin Barbecue. That's what it is. That's right. So apparently Franklin Barbecue is, is one of the icons, and one of the other ones is Salt Lick. Just uh, don't get the Salt Lick in the airport. There is a Salt Lick in the airport. It's not that it's bad. It's just that you want to go to the real Salt Lick Barbecue because it's, it's, it's an icon. But yeah, this city is growing super fast. It's like LA in the sense that nobody's actually from here anymore. Yeah, Ed just said LA had the Korean barbecue. Yeah, K-Town is awesome. Um, and yeah, the Korean barbecue there is extraordinary. But classic Midwestern barbecue. Texas is quite the icon, and Austin seems to be very much the center of it. I mean, you can't escape it. I mean, literally, you go like three blocks, and there's another place for barbecue. I, however, am one of the people who... I like dry barbecue. I don't like the fatty barbecue. Like a very lean cut. All right. Well, let's see. What time is it right now, Ed? It is four o'clock. All right. Uh, well, we need to pretty much wrap this up at this point. Um, let me apologize again. I can't apologize enough um, about screwing up the MR side of the recording. I will have that fixed next week, and then we'll do a three-week series on doing a, a a full creature. We'll say, you know, some kind of living thing with many limbs um, in VR and on desktop as well. Uh, and uh, kind of make up for that a little bit. So I apologize for all the problems. Thank you for bearing with it, along with not being able to hear Ed because Ed was very helpful here and uh, really wish we could hear him, but it seems like this was one of those great moments of multiple technical difficulties, one after another. And okay, little hand here, not entirely happy with it, 
may play around with it a little bit more, but I will show you guys much more workflow things, which um, over the next three webinars will basically be roughing out a form in VR to get proportions and produce the generic limbs. Um, then going into the desktop side and starting to refine things. And at that point, actually taking what is a sculpt on a single layer and duplicating it multiple times into multiple layers and erasing elements of the full creature so that you have different elements broken out into different layers, which improves performance and just the experience in general. And then finally going back into uh, a mixed mode of, you know, putting the headset on to do a few things in VR and, uh, you know, uh, hopping onto the desktop mode to do a few things in desktop because that is one of Canova's big strengths. And one of the things I was super adamant about when we started on this was it needs to be desktop and VR. We need to emphasize the workflows between the two um, because, um, you know, VR isn't necessarily the standalone uh, or it's, it's not a medium that is meant for doing a full sculpt from beginning to end, to end yet. Um, I think that will change in the near future. Um, but mixing the two together is hugely advantageous. So hopefully this was helpful, seeing a little bit of the way to approach things in Canova. Um, and uh, following this up, we'll have some things that are much more interesting, much more complicated, and much more well-nuanced. So thank you so much for watching, folks. Thank you, Pixel Fondue, for hosting us. You guys are awesome. And Ed, thank you for hopping on. And next week is going to go smooth as butter. So thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend or whatever awesome weekend you are having throughout the world.